Wow. Subjects like this is always a chance. <laughs> and I want to say to you men that are here, we are not excluding you today by any means. I honor the kind of man that you are that honors the woman in your life and the women in your life. I loved what Sandra did because it was so wonderful to go through all of my aunts that were so important in my growing up. It was just a wonderful time back in the 50s when uh, your mother had to go to work. You know, an aunt took care of you. It wasn't put in a nursery somewhere, but you had family back in those days that were a little closer together than sometimes they are uh, these days. Also, Kathy Davis, I don't want to miss uh, honoring her too with her for her work, which she does with prayer uh, with us here also. So if I left anybody out, just excuse me. Uh, you're all appreciated. But you that step up, I really do appreciate it. So <clears throat> that was really great. I enjoyed that. Uh, I'm taking this from a story. One thing that I do like about the Old Testament, the Old Testament are stories. And uh, the New Testament tells us that the Old Testament stories are for us as examples. So it's not going back into the history, but it's bringing history to us. Because there's some things that is universal or planetary human experience. And those are the things that really connect us together. I mean, every human being's got to breathe. Every human being's got to eat. There are just some things that you can't say, I don't believe that anymore. I'm going to start my own little group over here that doesn't believe that. There are just some things that you can't do that. There are certain things that is uh, what we share in the existence of being a human being uh, on this earth. So the New Testament is always a great story about our story, the story that we live, the path that we walk, uh, within ourselves. So this is what inspired me out of Exodus, the 15th uh, chapter and verses 19. Now, I'm not going to go through all of that, but uh, that's actually a picture of what, what went on in Exodus 15, and I'm going to talk about that in just a moment. I want to set the picture. The picture is that the children of Israel are in the desert. They're in the desert. They have left 430 years of slavery of in being in Egypt. And by the way, the word Egypt is from a Hebrew word that we get the English word misery, mitzvah. And we get misery from that. So they were leaving misery, <laughs> which is something we all relate to. We may not all, all relate to Egypt over there, but the Egypt in ourselves sometimes is we end up in the, a place of misery. So we don't have to stay there. This is about a journey of how to move out of misery and how that we can go into a land that is promised to us where the milk and the honey flows. I don't know about you, but that sounds pretty good to me. There is a place. The Bible says there's a place in us that the vulture's eye has not seen. That means death itself has not seen. That eternal part of us, that sacred part of us that is always there for us, no matter if things are high or they're low, or if we're in the garden, or if we're in the desert, it doesn't matter. There is that essence of the true self that is always there. So this is about the journey of them leaving Egypt and getting to the place in which had been promised them. And as I've already taught you that <clears throat> They didn't come, they came from a place that a lot of us still come from, is we think when we leave one thing, we're going right into the next thing. And we edit out the process of how to get to where we're going. And this is the thing that is so important. And I've been talking about this on Wednesdays also, that we need to learn uh, the technique, the how-to of doing things like healing. Healing's not magic. Healing is a process. Healing is a process of not doing, but undoing. It's a process of changing our perception, of seeing ourselves as, as less than, in lack, in need. When all of that is done away with us and peeled back from us, we see standing behind all that is that perfect whole self that was there all the time. I didn't have to fix 
You can't fix images. You can't fix perceptions. You can't fix delusions. You have to bring the light in to the darkness. And the light takes care of the darkness. I didn't have to deal with the darkness. I just have to bring the light in. And the light diminishes the darkness. Just as health and wholeness uh, diminishes illness and sickness. Hmm? That's just the way it works. So they're at a place where they had a lot of challenges because they did not figure out what was ahead of them. They just thought, get me out of Egypt, bring me into Canaan. And they forgot about that little patch of desert that was between where they had left and where they are going. Now, the desert there was not a punishment, but was an opportunity. It wasn't a problem. It was a, an opportunity. It was an opportunity for them to grow, to mature, to cleanse, and to undo the things that they did not want to take with them into the new land. Hmm? I know a lot of us would just like to move right on into the fifth dimension, into the new dimension, into the paradise, into the golden age, and all of that it sounds great to me. I wish I just had a magic wand and I could just put you there, but it's not working that way. It's working through us being a part of a process. And right now that process has brought us into a place in our wilderness experience where we're having to deal with things like this virus, racism, and all these kind of things like that. Again, we do not want to take with us into the next dimension. This is important. Into the next, next dimension, all these things we're trying to work with in this one. You don't go into the new dimension to work with your karma from a, 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 a dimension that created the karma in the first place. And that's why I think people miss it in so many different things. They're all looking to be fixed. They want to keep the old and make the old new. Hmm? They want to make people who are sick well. It doesn't work that way. If we really get the principles of spirit and metaphysics, you will see that all these things have already was accomplished at creation. You were created whole and well. So there is an aspect of self that remains on that vibration in that dimension that is always there available to us. But the ego gives us this illusion that I've lost something. We think major religions are based upon you come in lost. You've got to have a savior to save you because you're lost. The only thing we lost was our memory. The only thing we lost is the, the truth that we were created as and with. That's the only thing that needs to be found. And as we do that, we begin to see that what we're trying to fix cannot be fixed. It just needs to be let go of. It needs to be undone through the, through the technique that the Course of Miracles calls atonement or forgiveness. Same word, forgiveness, undoing. So here they are. They're already complaining. They barely got out of there. And they start complaining about they didn't have food. Moses, did you bring us out here just to die? Is this why we left Egypt for 400 years? Even though we were slaves, we were fed and we were taken care of. And you got us out here and we don't know what to do with this freedom. And Moses fell into that. He let the people pull him into that state of consciousness of doubt. Why are we out here and we're struggling? We have no water. We have no food. And then it says the Spirit spoke to his heart and says, Moses, because see, Moses had this staff, you know, walking stick, we call it. Had a walking stick. And it was a powerful walking stick stick. You know what the walking stick was? It was Aaron, the high priest's rod that when it was taken into the most holy place where the Shekinah presence of God was, that if that presence was still there, it blossomed. The stick blossomed because the presence brought life out of nothing. Out of an old just looking stick became a beautiful blossoming blossoming uh, experience. 
And that was handed down to Moses. So Moses is out here with the power of God. And every step he was taking, he was taking it in the power of God. But when this happened, it knocked him out consciously. When the people started complaining, he started doubting with them. And the Spirit spoke to his heart and says, Moses, what is that in your hand? Oh, I forgot. This is Aaron's rod. This is Aaron's. Yeah, this is the power represents the power of God is with me at all times. Every step that I take, no matter what the circumstances out here, food may be small, the water may be small, but I'm in the power of God has not left me. In other words, he remembered that he had the power of God in the desert. He had the power of God in the lack. He had the power of God when they had no water and where is it going to come from? He had the power of God when everybody was coming against him and talking about him and judging him. All along, he had the power of God. And when he woke up to that, he began to realize that God was going to take care of this situation and lead him through this time of being in the desert. The men, being men, Nothing wrong with that. Men are men. Sometimes there's all kinds of men. There's all kinds of men, but men are men. Men, I've always told you, is product. While the female is always process. So men like product. Men like tools. They like to fix things, but they're tools and whatever. So when they got under this situation in which they didn't know where the water was, where the food was, the men are trying to figure it out with their left brain how do we fix this guys they went into that mechanical and it just wasn't working <laughs> and all of a sudden one woman who was the sister of Moses and Aaron said this is enough we're not getting anywhere with this and she said, give me a tambourine. This is a tambourine. The picture was up there with her, the tambourine. <laughs> this is Miriam, is her name. And all of a sudden, Miriam jumps up with a tambourine and starts shaking it. Vibration. The woman knew that nothing's going to change until we change the vibration. Woo! I like that. Change the vibration. She began to dance to the vibration. She began to align herself with the vibration. Her body, her mind, and her spirit. And what was beautiful is the women all followed her with tambourines. And they began to dance in the wilderness. Yes, in verse 22, they found no water. Now I found this interesting because there's something about water and God and God and water that is quite fascinating throughout the writings. And I want to talk about that. Stop and think about it. How often would you see dancing in the desert? How often would you feel like dancing in the heat and the sand dunes and all the creatures in the desert and all of a sudden you want to dance? Be easy to dance in paradise. Dance in the lush fruit and vegetation of a place, but in the desert, the dry, barren desert, the woman started vibrating. The feminine in all of us went into a new frequency, a new vibration. This includes all of us. In Jeremiah 9, 17, it says, Consider the call of the women. Call them, it says. This is the Jewish Bible. Thus it says to Idonai, 
pay attention. Go and summon the mourning women so they will come and send those who are best trained so they will come. In other words, when it talks about wailing and mourning, it's talking about deep prayer. Now people, there's a prayer, and I've been blessed to see it. This is one of the things that I bring from my background. When I saw the deep prayer of intercession, it wasn't a nice little pretty prayer. It is a prayer almost of groaning. The Bible says you shall pray with groanings that could not be uttered. In other words, you've lost into words until it's the travail of the soul. The soul is feminine. Suke, it is woman. And it is her travail. It is her groaning that brings forth. That's why when birth is brought forth, the woman is groaning. Right after she says, never touch me again. <laughs> That's the last word she speaks <laughs> at that moment. <laughs> then she goes into the groaning. Because the groaning and this deeper prayer shall bring forth and birth and bring forth. What must happen before that is the water must break. So every person comes in at the breaking of the water. Women have fought for their role in the corporate and political world, but have always been prevalent in the spiritual world. Even though women have, for decades and decades, dealt for equal pay, to be treated equally, and to be treated honestly as women, <laughs> honorably as women, for a long time. But let me tell you, from as long as I can remember, the strength of the church was the women. At least in the churches that I know. Ministers may drove up in their Cadillac with their nice suits on and whatever when women had been there all night long cooking chicken dinners <laughs> to raise money for Pastor's Day. Now, I'm not saying women should not work, but you should want to work, not have to. You should not have to carry everything, but women have. In fact, I am convinced there would be no church today if it was not for women. And if not that is, if that's not true, then it'd be a really sadder church than it is today. So here are the women changing the vibration in a time in which people are saying there is no water. So our story begins today with a flamboyant dance in the desert. They seem to see the desert as an, an elevated place of consciousness through rhythm, movement, sound, rather than looking at it as a place of sand dunes, heat, and dust hills. God and water. Genesis 1-2 says God moved on the face of the water. God moved on the face of the water. Now let me tell you something that we've learned in dealing with vibration and sound and tuning forks and all of that. We have learned that water is one of the best conductors of sound and vibration. In other words, water carries vibration through the system powerfully. That's why that you can do things like an oil, as we learned, in the bottom of the feet or somewhere in the body and the whole body is benefited from that as it moves through the system of the body. It's the same way with sound. You put sound into the ears, into the auditory system, the vagus system, it goes into all the systems are going to carry that subtle vibration into all of the body, not just where you place it. The body is a system, a living organism of a system. Finally, Moses got water out of the rock. 
you think you get water out of the ocean or the well or where there's water is where you want to get water. But a rock, an old hard, dry rock, even that held water representing the presence and spirit of God. John the Baptist baptizing Jesus in water caused the heavens to open and a voice to say, This is my son. I'm well pleased. Peter walks on the water, which is faith, to meet Jesus. Faith and Jesus meet on the water. Jesus tells us to drink of his water and will never thirst. Human beings' lungs are 63% water. Brain and heart is 73% water. Your skin is 64% water. Muscles and kidneys are 79% water. Hmm. A book came to my hand recently called When Women Pray. When Women Pray. I love this book. Uh, you that know T.D. Jakes, he did a wonderful job on this particular book. And he's taken a lot of the women of the Bible and how powerful their prayers were. When we see how that when women pray can do everything, including bringing forth new life. New life. Mary, God brings healing and redemption through the angelic thoughts of the guidance. That's what the angel represents. When, when Gabriel spoke to Mary, it was spiritual thoughts of guidance to solve problems. How can this be? That's how the story goes. How can this happen? And then these angelic thoughts came to her and solved the problem that allowed life to come through her. Women adjusted their posture while gathering the water. Again, while men were picking up tools to try to figure out where the water was, how to work the water, the women postured themselves in the desert to bring forth the water that was in the desert. Naomi causes curses to be turned into blessings. Hmm. And then we have Naomi Naomi is the great grandmother of King David, King Psalms. And David, therefore, is the son of Jesse and of Judah, and then produced Jesus. So through the lineage of these women came the manifestation of the incarnated Christ through humanity. None of us would even know that we were who we are if it was not for the bringing forth of a human being that manifested who they were. Esther gained victory over injustice. You have to read these stories, but they're quite fascinating. Could have stayed on the sidelines, but rather jumped into the fight and made a difference when you read her story. She did not hold back, but got involved. Psalms, which is where the song came from today. You have turned my mourning into dancing. You have loose, loosed me from the sackcloth and clothed me with gladness. One of my favorite stories about dancing is King David himself. King David was a dancer. Now, there's 19 dynasties of kings over Israel in the Bible. 
David was different than any of the other 18 kings and dynasties. None of them are reported singing, worshiping, dancing, or music. Only David. Make a joyful noise unto the Lord, for the Lord is good. He talks about the timbrels. Clap your hands, all you people. All these kind of things that we see in a lot of these churches that I come from that people do is right out of the Bible. It's the way they worshiped and praised, praised God. And the reason was is because David was not under the king, what the kings had been under in the Old Testament God of Jehovah or Yahweh. I'll tell you, when you're under Yahweh, you don't feel like dancing. <laughs> because you're trying to keep 613 laws so that you can appease this God. Hmm? You got to watch what you eat. You got to watch what you wear. You got to watch 613 different things that Yahweh gave people before they could be accepted under the law. Hmm. But David said, I sing praises to the Most High, El Elyon. Difference. Yahweh. Now, why is that important? Because David was tapping into a world that was yet to come or an age that had not started yet. He went into hundreds, a few thousand years into the future in which when the Christ came forth and was there to change the priesthood from Aaron to Melchizedek, who was the priest of the Most High, Christians have the story all wrong in their own Bible. They believe that the Holy Spirit came upon Mary and she conceived Jesus. That's in their creed. That's in the Apostles' Creed. That's not what happened at all. If you read it carefully, without the dogma, you would see in the story that Mary is chosen to bring forth the Christ into the human realm. Through a woman. Because the woman represents the womb of consciousness. Hmm? In sacred geometry, it's called the Visica Pisces. Where those two circles come together to create that third place in between, that portal. Between is what Mary represents. The womb of consciousness. And the womb of consciousness had a thought that it did not know how to accept. How shall this be? I know no man. Now, I'm not into the doctrine here of Christianity to argue it. I'm just telling you the story. Let's get it right in context. And she's going, I don't get how this could be. And then the angel Gabriel shows up, which are divine thoughts, come to her and begins to say, you're not ready. So I'm going to send the Holy Spirit upon you to get you ready. So the Holy Spirit's kind of the foreplay of consciousness. <laughs> before penetration takes place. Hear what I'm saying from a spiritual point. I want God's thoughts to penetrate my human thoughts. Huh? When I need direction, I want divine thought, angelic thoughts to come into my thoughts and say, go here or go there or stay put. This is what's going to get you through, is getting in touch with your angel thoughts of guidance. Now, if you've got a fluffy white angel that's showing up, good for you. <laughs> but you better turn them into thoughts, directions, clear, clarity of, of your life. And how to get through this time in the desert that we find ourselves. It said after the Holy Spirit had prepared her, then what happened? The Most High overshadowed her and she conceived. David knew this was going to happen. He knew that there was going to be a higher aspect of God that was going to show up 
2,000 years ago called the Most High. The Most High, not Yahweh. Yahweh, Jesus is not the Son of Yahweh. It scares me when they say the Son of God because I want to say what God are you exactly talking about. No, son here is the expression of the higher aspect of a God called El Elyon, the Most High. And that's who I worship today. And it said because David had that glimpse to eat of that uh, bread of the new age that was to come called grace, it wasn't there, but he, he partook of it anyway. See, this is, this is what you are as, as a community of new thought people. What you did 10, 20, 30 years ago or whenever you came into all of this, what you did is you looked beyond and saw an age that isn't showing up, but it's coming. Hmm? You saw it in your vision. Somebody help me. Amen. You saw it in your spirit. You saw it in faith. And you knew things are going to change. Things are going to get better. The kingdom is going to come. And it's going to be done on earth just as it is in heaven. Hmm? And because you saw that, you begin to find water in the desert. And the water may be new thought, unity, metaphysics, or somebody that came along and thinks like you did, and you're not alone, but somehow you got water in your desert. And you begin to drink of water that man does not know about. For out of your inner being shall flow rivers of water, and this he spake of the Spirit. And he that drinks of my water shall never thirst again. You are the collective visionary of another age that is trying to break in. Trying to break through. So this made David happy, even in the midst of Yahweh and all these laws and judgments and, and this craziness that was going on in the Old Testament. David found a vision beyond that, and it made him so happy that he started dancing. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Woo! The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. And it said this, David danced so hard. And he was wearing this ephod, which is a religious garment, <laughs> which represents the outer personality of ego. He shook and vibrated, and music was playing until he danced out of his clothes. <laughs> and his wife is looking through the window. Oh, my God. What has he done now? I've never been so embarrassed in my life. What are you doing, David? Sometimes you need to vibrate and shake and dance a little bit hmm? until you get rid of the cloak and the outer shell of that that tries to imprison you into the limitations of human belief and separations. David danced. David danced. Well, quickly, I have a few minutes. <clears throat> I want to give you some, there's so many, I, I found so many different wonderful scriptures. Dancing can reverse signs of aging in the brain. The hippocamp uh, hippocampus is a small curve formation in the brain that plays an important role in the limbic system. The hippocampus is involved in the formation of new memories and also associated with learning and emotions. Hmm. And we learned oils to also do that yesterday. Start bringing in the forks, the vibration, the oils, and all this thing. And that's what we need to do, Ron, is we need to put this thing together. Put oils and vibration and frequency and sound together. <laughs> I heard that. <clears throat> this is why I love Bonnie. I told Bonnie I'm going to use her today. Bonnie is the dancer of this community. No doubt about it. She is going to dance if there's any rhythm at all. And I want to say to Bonnie, I believe that is because it is written in your story. You are part of these Hebrew women. 
who grabbed the tambourine and started dancing out in the wilderness. That story's in your lintage, uh, in your culture, in your blood. <laughs> now you Gentiles, you need to learn it. <laughs> you that can't get the clap, can't get the thing, you're going... <laughs> learn, we'll teach you. We'll teach you how to find the rhythm. It's important. Dance is a prayer. I'm going to go through these quickly. Dance is a meditation. Try to dance and think of other things. You won't do it. Dance will bring you into the moment. Dance is being in the moment. Dance provides an escape. Oftentimes when I'm sitting in my chair in my room and watching mindless television and not feeling good, if I can get myself up and turn over to a station where the music is and just get up and start <laughs> dancing, I'm energized in that moment. Yes, the bones creak a little bit and crack and <laughs> whatever. You don't have to overdo it. Just do what you can. Even if it's in a chair, with your fingers, with your hand, <laughs> with your arms. We used to sing an old song in the African churches that said, if I couldn't say a word, I'll just raise my hand. <laughs> if I couldn't say a word, I'll just raise my hand. Do what you can with what you got <laughs> to do. Dancing provides connection with others. If we had group dancing here, I'll guarantee you, you will be drawn into each other's. Each other's gaze, each other's ability to be seen and feel the connectedness between each one of us. Dance promotes a healthy and active lifestyle. Dance is really the ultimate therapy. It is so important that we keep movement in our life. This is why I want to encourage you that want to come out on Wednesday and do the Tai Chi. Uh, give it a try. I have no idea what we're exactly doing, but I know it's uh, something we can all do. So don't let that come into your mind that I kind of can't move. I've kind of got arthritis. I got this, that, and another. You come and do what you can do. Just come and do it. And you say, well, I could do that at home. It's going to be much better together. Trust me. That's one thing I do miss about the gyms. I'm not ready to go back to a gym, but I get, sometimes get caught up in the synergy of a gym. You know, watching other people doing that made me feel more like doing that. So we can do that here the best that we possibly, possibly can. So dance in the desert. Women shall lead us into the next level of our consciousness. <laughs> Carmela, did I say it? Is that pretty close? Camela. That's a hard one for me to do. I think that Kamala Harris is placed strategically in the right place. No doubt about it. This is the only way that a woman will ever attain to this position will be through that direction of the vice presidency, probably, rather than going straight to the presidency. And we don't know what the plan is, how long Joe will be there, whatever. We just don't know if there's not a plan. But I do think at this time that we're going to see more women show up in the power of government and other duties. And men, you got to admit it, men's been out there in the desert with their tools trying to figure it out. <laughs> Digging holes for water in the wrong places. <laughs> Having wars. And it's time for a woman to grab that tambourine. A collective woman to grab that tambourine and start shaking it. And say, yes, we're in the desert, but there is water here. Hmm. And my favorite verse that I want to end up with you is that when 
The water is found in the desert. The desert shall blossom as a rose. So I think the message that I want to leave you with today is no matter how things look and how barren and changed your life is right now, you're not without. There is no lack of water. There is no lack of seed in the desert. There is no lack of opportunity. There is no lack uh, of, of your needs. I think everything is provided to us at this time. Dance. Find the rhythm of change. You know, I remember as a kid going to something called Cotillion. Remember that? That's a South thing, isn't it? In the South, I did that a lot. Cotillion. You know, they wanted to teach me this one, two, three, two. and being dyslexic, that is not working for me. <laughs> you know, piano, they tried that, and I went, pat, 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 goes the old speed boat, pat. It's not working for me. But when disco came in, <laughs> and people just started free dancing to the rhythm and to the music, I jumped in. I said, that's for me. I love that. I won't be sitting here thinking about how many steps this way and how many steps that way. Just let me feel the energy. Just let me feel and let it move through my body and take me wherever that it wants to go. And you know what? Whether I was good at it or not, I sure thought I was. Because <laughs> I went into a place of, a, of uh, enlight enlightenment a place of entrainment, a place in which things came together in me. My mind, my body, my spirit, all of that became one thing in that moment. And I loved that feeling. In church, we danced. I was a dancer. When the Holy Ghost hit me, I danced. And I danced for a long time, and I danced all over the place. I've danced on the back of pews. I've danced uh, out in the dark places. We used to have these Brush Arbor tent meetings, and then the spirit would hit me, and I'd disappear out in the woods. <laughs> and they'd say, oh, he'll be back. <laughs> and I, I'd come back, but I've always had the dance in my feet, my feet. So please, whether it's literal or metaphorically, dance. Find your song and dance to it. Your song is your life purpose. Dance to it. Find the rhythm of it. And we're going to get through this thing and come out the other side into a land where the milk and...